Oh man. Oh geez. Why is it gonna be so expensive? <sighs> uh, let me see what I got. Um. Will this do? No. Okay. Uh. Well. Uh, uh. How about this? No. Ah, damn it. But the gameplay looks so good, though. Man, these Sony first-party games have gotten out of hand. So perhaps we should turn the clock back to where it all began. To a time when Sony was in a bit of a funny place. The late PS1 era, where uh, they uh, were trying to replicate successes seen on their platform by other studios themselves again. Like how wow. Legend of Dragoon was a direct response to Final Fantasy VII in the hopes that they too could eat some of that hot, big JRPG pie. I suppose when all you've been making is weird experimental titles, you do at one point want to chase the money and therefore chase the express. Doing what Dragoon doing for both Metal Gear Solid and the Resident Evil series, taking the survival horror formula framework and applying it to a cinematic, action-packed, high-stakes sneak man game. Telling the tale of incredibly well-acted evil Russians called the Knights of the Apocalypse. Knights of the Apocalypse? What do you want? I am planning to use this train to obtain funds for our activities. Hijacking a NATO military train and you, Jack Morton, being the only dude able to do something about it. Mm. I mean, it's not exactly Solid Snake, but he'll do, I guess. Any questions? How do we get in the train? Well, duh. Stupid. You shoot motherfuckers, find keys, solve puzzles, find more keys, and very slowly camera angle your way about the place. Chris. Huh? You see, Chase the Expressy came out in 2000. By this point in time, the survival horror game genre had gotten a little bit... Oh, well, dumb. Sure, Carrier has pretty nice atmosphere. But then it's also all like... I am Terry! <laughs> the ship doctor! <laughs> Not to mention titles like Trag. With this disc, I shall become ruler of the entire world! <laughs> Hold it right there, Miguel. But he's already gone! So, taking the genre's general format and using it for solid snakian action movie action really ain't all that bad of a call from the Millennium POV. That said, one may also be led to think that tank controls, aka slow tank controls that get the player stuck on door frames a lot, ain't exactly well suited for said action. And while it does have quick turns and strafe rolls and cool auto lock-on that negates any and all thinking while killing, it is very much a slower game because of this. Basically, it's a lot as if RE1 had MGS's set piece based structure, using the long double decked train to make each car its own self contained puzzle, moment, or vibe, with objectives often being simply to unlock access to the next car or set thereof. One moment sees the player engaging with filtration systems to clear up a chemical mist to get a key card, or maybe dodging infrared lasers in a way not quite as agile as Leon from RE4 did, and the next you're self-destructing a fucking nuke as everyone comes running and gunning for you, or blasting down shoppers by the dozen with Gatling guns all to get a curiously shaped amulet shoved into the fun 
funny hole. Because, of course, your survival horror train has to have the funny hole. It is nice, though, as this segmentation also means that both backtracking and inventory management are kept to a big, big minimum. For example, while the item slots are resident Hillian, healing shits and ammo stack indefinitely, and thus, whatever item boxing you're left with is really only mostly stuffing shits away you've used once and likely will no longer need, rather than figuring out how to bring and what to where and what you do need. Granted, I am a tiny bit mixed on this. On one hand, fuck yeah. No constant uncertainties or a billion locked doors to keep in mind. I am confidently starting ahead with one key card that's clearly labeled as according to what car or door within it belongs to. The most complicated Express ever gets is having to combine a hook with a crossbow to make a grappling hook to do this goofy bullshit. Man, look at this fucking guy over here. But after a while, I did end up with a ton of trash as puzzle items don't evaporate after use, leaving you with a lot to annoyingly scroll through or to have to make little trips back to the shit house next door just to deposit the key card. I knew I wouldn't need any longer and uh, let's just say it's not exactly the fastest moving game in regards to walking speeds and loading times. To its credit, however, I never once needed to check a guide, which I must say is a sign of me fucking with its puzzle design. No riddles, no crazy item combining, it's pretty chill in that sense. It even has a handy mini map. Wow! Yeah, it, <laughs> it has its use, to be fair. Seeing how camera angles flip you up from, from left to right, to from, from right to left by way of away, and to the cam that spins to, to the cam and away from. So it's a good way to know which car the door I'm in front of now will take me to, and it showing its number is also helpful. And in either case, there is plenty of forward momentum in the Express's pacing, especially with how some of the set pieces can yeet you back to different cars. It's, it's not like you're linearly working your way through the train in order. One can be passing cars up top, slinging through a hatch, clear the first half, and then go through the undersight maintenance passage back to the car before it, and blah 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 blah. Time for Patreon. Damn, son. Get a load of this. New album. It's good. Go check it out. Please! Damn, I really love this game's visual design. Boasting a fun mix of real-time and renderings. Like, I'm not entirely sure what's going on here, but it appears to me as if they rendered bits and pieces of a holy CG scene out to use as textures. Wrapped, wiggling, and warping about a fully in-engine 3D scene, which I don't think I've ever seen a game do before. Thus, resulting in rather sleek lighting, detailed blood and gore, and a really cute camera mode. Even doing a wee sneaky peeky before MGS2 would do. And while Jack, uh, if, if I'm even remembering his name right, isn't a man of many words, I do find his commentary immensely relatable in this particularly visualized setting. Cause I mean, colorful bottles. Is it not exactly what I thought while well, I was camera panning around? Because look at this whole ass room. The light sheets coming in through window, the sense of motion behind them, the warm lighting on the green counters, the classy train tiles pairing up with them nicely, and then colorful bottles. <laughs> it's such a cutely crafted space. Jack looks at the smashed up food and sadly remarks, What a waste. So again, look at this shit. The way the bloodied up pixel kitchen shakes as I pan, struggle to present all its wee details is giving paper craft to me. There's a fickleness about it that I quite adore observing. Not to mention the classy, yeah. shiny wood hallway. A strain as real PS1 so fist of future energy. Drag, FF8, Tekken 2, that shit where shit's like future tech, bleepy shit. But also wood grain finish, fancy tiling and engravings. Potted palms. Classy bars and red carpets. And the shiny shading really helps selling that sort of energy just as it did in many a PS360 title. I can just picture myself villainously smoking cigars and drinking wine with my cyborg arm on this train, you know what I mean? It's all rather... Oh. 
scrumptiousy. Back in 2018, I made a video on how trains were utilized in games as narrative tools. Either funneling characters, forcing them to interact or confront, or to really condense down a adventure gamey mystery, or how they could lock in a claustrophobic sense of spooks or be used as easy action corridors. And so, as a dedicated train game, my biggest question is undoubtedly going to be, how does Chase the Express fare on the trains in games -ometer? It's not explicitly a horror title, but there is a palpable sense of tension in how narrow everything is. I mean, yeah, you have your action hank dodge roll, but <laughs> where the fuck are you even rolling to? And whenever guys pop up, it can certainly be a smidge startling, especially with it using spooky cues in general. It's a very the walls have eyes sort of feeling that it instills. Strutting through these claustrophobic corridors, hearing nothing but train sounds and the odd mechanical clunk. Surrounded solely by corpses, blood and the evidences of plundering and conflict. Showers still wet, having just been used. Computer still up and running. It is just the schisms of life, leaving nothing but the knowledge of how freshly it's just been snuffed out by a terroristic presence. And that sort of anxiety, I guess you could call it, is something the plot defo tries to tap into too. Again, year 2000 release, about a train from Moscow to Paris, filled with politicians ready to do a unifying trade deal gone awry. The notes speak of fears of how forming the EU could cause a reflaring of East and West tensions. The terrorists are also upset about NATO involvement, being that they're ex-KGB. All of it, to me, defo feels at least a little bit pressing with how several countries are scrambling to join the EU and NATO at the moment with Putin acting sus. And mayhaps it's solely because of how close I am to all of that geographically that this did get me to care about the narrative intrigue despite its nothing burger cast as a... Yeah, you know, there's generic man, woman, politician, commander, and villain. Nor is shit particularly cutscene heavy either. I suppose that isn't to say that the FMV isn't at least a little bit salacious whenever they do happen. I possess all the wealth in the world. Yes, now I am Rex Mundi, the king of the world. <laughs> but most of it is simply really penisy FMV of the in-game models not being in engine. Reason being, I think, is because we have an insane amount of split paths on our hands here. Very small, granular details can make a big difference in story. Who lives or dies, where and when, do you give a thing or not, were you on time or not, etc. This means that they had to do shit tons of variations for each cutscene. My ending, for example, looks very different than what I saw this long play get. Who knew that this wasn't the best ending? Not about to play it again ASAP, but that's definitely really cool, and I'm also guessing that that's probably why the puzzle items don't evaporate. Sort of keeps the mystique of what could be used and, and splitting ways alive, I guess. So, hey, not gonna lie though, I can see why though, at its time though. Chase the Express reviewed about as well as fucking God Hand did. Thing is, as was the bane of many PS2 survival horror games as well, journos of the era were largely getting a bit tired of this format of game. And by 2000 standards, it plays rather archaically as well. Having to manually pick items from your inventory when you're in the right spot, for instance, or the heaps of unvoiced dialogue, even if the codecs do look cute and remind me of the MSX Metal Gears. It is closer to a RE1 than something like Fatal Frame or Dino Crisis 2 purely on a interfacing level, and it's definitely no MGS cinematically speaking either. But I don't really mind. Now would also be the time where I admit to having played the whole thing on rookie mode. 
Unlike how I did with Wanted Dead or White Day, I don't have an excuse to make up, nor do I think I should. It's just so I prefer to play games. Shut the fuck up. Certainly, with old school survival horror type games, uh, my favorite ones are DC2, Track, and Resi 3, and Code V on Easy, Big Guns, Big Explosions, No Thoughts, No Worries type beats. And this one was a pretty fun romp in that way, too. Luckily, it's also about six hours long, as for all the good I've said about its pacing, it does kinda reach a point after a while where it runs out of train to send you to, and so it makes you go back and forth a fair bit in the last couple hours. And so, thus, while I had my fun, by the time it was done, I was done. Oh yeah, cute little game. Good job, Jumping Flash team. Shout out, Robit. Uh, okay, so, uh, how about a Villam Orb? Villam Orb. No. <laughs>